streaming software. गुड इवनिंग एवरीबडी हुएवर इज हियर a uh, very very good evening to you and uh, in this covid era we have uh, started this exercise from aims and uh, rp center has taken this uh, we've started with the initial phase of uh, six uh, lectures by the cinema six faculty our unit professors and then subsequently we'll design some other education program for the for the residents here who Number nearly 130, and our senior is about 50. So I'll go talk with without delaying any more of your time. I'll start straight away to the topic, which is age-related macular degeneration. This is something which is very going to be prevalent in a big way, already being seen a lot, and uh, everybody is realizing that people do get visually handicapped. They require LBA and other gadgets to see in uh, light, as well as in the evenings they feel very incapacitated so i'll tell you about the emerging therapies the various treatments that what is the evidence as to what we should do at this stage so i'll tell you a little bit about this and in this one hour and uh, 45 minutes because that's the time we have at the set facility aims now this is kind of an epidemic which is awaiting us and it's already already with us it's not as bad as the covid 19 pandemic but it's we don't have to Look at only COVID. We've got other diseases to look after also, and that's what I've been telling the director. Aim. So, this is WHO estimating nearly 10 million blind, which is a rough figure. Could be more in India because we don't have so much of data. The Rotterdam study done uh, in the in Europe showed about very severe visual loss of 60, and Arvind uh, Madurai had done a very comprehensive eye study, age-adjusted prevalence of AMD 3.1. It said the QOL was very severely affected. So this is a picture of hard rosin, which are well circumscribed, yellowish, and they're not fuzzy margins. So this is hard rosin, which often don't predispose to new vascular AMD or the wet form. Now risk factors: aging is the most important, and gender, of course, it's seen more in females. The Beaver Dam conclusively proved that smoking is definitely associated with it, as is smoking with many other diseases of the eye. cardiovascular disease and hypertension has hypertension has got a very major role to play with amd whether it's dry or the non neovascular or the neovascular form it's no longer called dry and wet it's by the way its proper terminology is neovascular non neovascular amd the family history there is some kind of a genetic predisposition and it's seen more in relatives uh, but it's not very uh, definite about the genetic inheritance nutritional studies have been shown that Uh, there is a benefit of taking dietary carotenoids like lutein uh, and uh, zeaxanthin zinc omega 3 fatty acids even though areds to showed it wasn't much of help but even then omega 3 fatty acids do play a role and flax seeds and all do help in people and uh, it's important to give them the substitute uh, this more of a natural uh, substitutes whichever are possible otherwise we do give them antioxidants Genetic risks have shown that patients with polymorphisms of complement factor VIII, uh, factor H, uh, increased risk with pa patients who had polymorphisms of uh, uh, factor VIII, factor H, the complement factor H. And lempalizumab is one of the drugs which this has been is undergoing trials. So the uh, trials, I think, phase two, phase three, which are trying to inhibit complement or fa complement factor H. And uh, I'll come from here to. non neovascular amd is a dry form before i come to the wet form the dry form is not does not cause so, such a severe uh, visual loss but it's very important because people do get it and they are visually handicapped it has four categories as per the national institute of health washington bethesda washington no amd with small drusen less than 63 category 2 is 63 to 64 or 64 to 124 and this is multiple small drusen but it's larger than 63 So the size-wise category, 
Intermediate is greater than 6, 124. So it's just going in sequence 63, 63, 64 to 124, then greater than 124. And with or without geographic atrophy, not involving the center in another eye. Category 4 is an advanced AMD characterized by GA involving the fovea. And uh, that's very important. So what is highlighted is category 3 and 4. Category 3 and the 4 are the ones which require antioxidants. And this is the ARET2 study, which finally said, which is the latest study as of now for uh, nutritional supplementation, they said that ARET2 category 3, 4 require antioxidants and 6 to 18 months if they're asymptomatic, even if they're asymptomatic, they should be taking and we should get these color pictures, OCT, autofluorescent imaging, very important and NAMS are great for such patients. And uh, this is a dose you should give at least for 6 to 18 months if they're ARETS2 formula went through a lot of, uh, you know, uh, varying doses came up about zinc and all and whether they should add beta carotene or not. And finally, they decided on 500 vitamin A, 400 vitamin E, uh, 10 milligrams of lutein and zeaxanthin. These are carotenoids. And zinc, they decided to not to reduce the dose but to keep it 80 milligrams zinc. Copper is basically, it uh, prevents the copper deficiency anemia which can occur because of zinc absorption. The copper deficiency anemia in the blood which can occur, we have to give some supplemental copper, which is 2 milligrams. And no beta carotene because of the risk of uh, lung cancers as well as in passive smokers. It's a good sense to eat rich, diet rich in fruits, nuts and dark green leafy vegetables. Be good, being good source of lutein and uh, besides that, the hypertension should be well controlled. So, we also have soft drusen which are precursors to new vascular wet AMD. And here the Amsler grid gets affected. This Amsler grid is a very useful test. It's a subjective test which tests at 20 milligrams of the central, 20 degrees of the central field, 10 degrees on each side of the fixation point. So I encourage in the OPD that all my residents, they also get used to it. That we see the, I would tell the patient to see the Amsler grid. It's a unioclear test. Close the other eye, read, read, uh, read, the, read give press mapping correction. And then ask them to see if the chart, look at the center of the dot. They don't have to look at the side. When they see the center of the dot, then they have to tell us whether there's a metamorphopsy or absence of a, uh, the squares at all totally. So they tell us this is very good for CSR, very good for AMD, very good for central lesions, which are affecting the macula. So they can do it as a home screening test once a week or once, twice a week. So reticular pseudodrusen are an entity which is close to a drusen, but not exactly drusen. They're not so few, but they're in a more of a network lace form. And this is pre-RP, unlike the histologically pre-RP, unlike the uh, deeper to the RP drusen. The drusen on the drusen, uh, drusen are present on the Brooks membrane, deeper to the RP. This is superficial to the RP. That's a very important point for even for MCQ. And its occurrence is most seen in the AMD. It yellow white net and usually a sign of rod dysfunction. So these people generally have bilateral dorsal. They have pseudodorsal usually bilateral. They'll have this net-like formation, more so on the temporal quadrant, and uh, they have rod dysfunction, and uh, they have associated uh, uh, presence. They they do predispose to AMD. So you can see on the OCT multiple elevations uh, just under the neurosensory retina. And this is because of the pseudodrusin present. So what is the imaging required for non neovascular AMD? For non neovascular AMD, the best imaging required is probably the, the autofluorescent imaging. You take a color picture. You want to get an infrared picture also. But AF gives you a lot of information. It tells you the, exactly the amount of area which is totally devoid of lipofuscin and it is totally absent. This is totally degenerated dead retina. This area has some degree of lipofuscin, so it's partially hyper autofluorescent. Hence, these are not totally degenerated. They may be degenerating, but this is still activity is there in these cells. They're active. The rest of the retina looks normal. So this tells you how it progresses and uh, it tells you about uh, exactly. And you don't need to do anything beyond this if you don't have a CNVM. And the OCT shows you atrophic macula. If you've got a CNVM coming out, intermediate dosin, intermediate AMD, then it's different. But of course, if the patient has no symptoms and these people may not have a vision very poor, it may be something like 636, 624. Sometimes we supplies the fovea is spared, it could be 618, 612. 
So it's a non-neovascular AMD is not so severe. Now they have a there's a differential diagnosis you should know. Bullseye maclopathy. Patient, you should ask the history of chloroquine intake. Now even in uh, COVID, they are saying take high doses of chloroquine. Go take it. But they are saying all the same time the American Academy has advised that it could cause toxicity to the chloroquine, but the dose they used is nearly three to four times as high. They're using nearly thousand milligrams a day. So that's very high dose. It's about five, four times the natural dose for which you give for arthritis or for any other disease which is systemic, uh, even on arthritis and all which they give for. Another uh, may not be so clear, but it's a honeycomb dystrophy on AF. So the AF plays a big role on imaging for AMD and for differential diagnosis, even for star guards and all that, you know, we can really pick it up very clearly with the with the uh, AMD, with the autofluorescent imaging. So now coming to the more important neovascular AMD, it's a grayish subretinal exudates. Uh, they have presence of unexplained heme, unexplained exudates, presence of PD. So if you unexplained these kind of things in the macula in a patient more than 40, 45, 50 years of age, you better start hunting. Hunting for what? Check his vision, check the Amazon grid. According to me, it's a very important test, though it's subjective. Um, get the slit lamp microscopy done as far as possible. Do it yourself and uh, look for the signs of hemorrhage, unexplained hemorrhage, and do they appear in the form of a grayish, dirty membrane or a yellowish, brownish with some hemorrhage at the edges. When you get hemorrhages at the edges of a membrane that is pathognomonic of a CNVM, hemorrhages will also be always be present at the advancing edge of the CNVM. The CNVM progresses rapidly, one to two, three, maybe five microns every day. So it tends to come paramacrophobial, but tends to progress towards the fovea. Hence the importance to treat early. After a few days, the CNVM may have come very close to the juxtafoveal or near foveal region. So this is the advancing edge and got to be careful. This is a CNVM which is active. The other form is that which I told you, the mortal fluorescence, lack of RP, which we just seen before. That's a non-neovascular AMD not dry. So don't call it dry and wet. Call it neovascular AMD, 10% and not, uh, uh, neovascular AMD, uh, it's only 10% but it's devastating visual loss. And dry is more common, it's 90% but the visual loss is mild to moderate. And uh, you can't do much about it as of now. So we come to the next uh, wet AMD, the efflorescing picture, lacy network of new vessels with some hemorrhage around it. And uh, this is, you know, very classic, but you can get occult CNVM. This is an old classification, the occult CNVM, where you have a small, a large, serious PD with subretinal fluid, and uh, there could be a little fluid here also, and there may be a, some neovascular tissue over here. So this is occult CNVM is very akin to what you see in polypodal, polypodal choroidal vasculopathy. So occult CNVM, the vision does loss is not so severe. So you can have a serious PD or a fibrovascular PD. In occult CMM, you can get late leakage of unknown origin. So fibrovascular PD or a serous PD or a late leakage on FA. These are FA diagnosis. FA of unknown origin, stipple process. So that is occult CMM. This came at the time of TAP study and WIP study and all that. So those are little older, outdated studies. Now. So occult with this thing and it's got a plaque or a hot spot here. That's the area when this is a notch. It could be a notch here and uh, you could ha probably have a neovascular complex here. There's some fluid. So differential diagnosis of occult and uh, uh, this thing, we are neovascular in a classic CNVM is you can get a something called as adult onset fovea vitelliform dystrophy or fovea vitelliform dystrophy of adult nature. This you can get vitelliform deposits due to degeneration of the photoreceptors. The degenerate photoreceptors collect in the serious compartment that is a serious detachment above the RP. So all the degenerated RP, the degenerated photoreceptors collect here and form this vitelliform dystrophy. The vision does not get worse. They can develop a secondary CNVM, but that with time they get it in the 40s, 50s, it stays stable. So you don't have to give anti -vegers. Once you diagnose it, it's usually bilateral and uh, once you diagnose it, you can just let go. You call for a serial follow-up, that's it. To look for secondary CNVM. Then Best's heterodomacular dystrophy which has, can, can also develop a neovascular membrane. So I'm telling you conditions which can develop CNVM but they're not age related. Okay, but they can be in ages which can be close to age related. So this you can get, you know, various forms, the best renopathies, 
uh, at the best disease the best goes through six phases you have the scrambled you have the full egg then you have the scrambled egg which is broken up and uh, this is a picture where the your telephone has kind of a, given way to a this thing uh, empty space so and here there's some pigmentation so what we did was we just got a OCTA done the OCTA showed us the new vascular membrane in the right eye so what we concluded was that we did have a uh, best disease with secondary CNVM so this was a CNVM and this was the vitelliform deposit which is there in the best so you can have adult vitelliform deposits they're like, a, they're like debris or garbage so they're just lying there or you can get some new vessels in the bests also okay other eye the left eye shows some uh, vitelliform deposit so macular telling dictates it is another di differential diagnosis where you can get a uh, pale kind of a sheen uh, metallic sheen like picture with some pigmentation and sometimes you can get some very severe macular foveal dystrophy with cavitation lesion these are loss of retinal tissue and there is new there is a new vessel formation which is a cnvm the cnvm is picked up beautifully on octa so act octa is actually taking over from choroidal, choroidal angiography because this is a non-invasive test with the advent of covid we'll shift more and more to it's not a question of invasive non-invasive but I suppose you don't want to touch your eye too close to the put the, but then probably it's it's not blood bound so IV test will also be valid. Only thing is the chin rest and the uh, the forehead rest has to be cleaned with uh, sterilium and somewhat about a plastic wrap on the lens. You can prove that. So you can see the early CNVM formation definitely here on the right side. So yes. <clears throat> case of a choroidal osteoma all, are, all these are my cases from the OPD and these are choroidal osteoma very severe bo uh, this is bone formation in the entire choroid there's no nothing left and there's some regeneration of the macula and there's a CNVM here so you can make out on the OCT there's a CNVM present so we couldn't get his OCTA somehow we tried to focus on to the irregular surface we could get the OCTA but the vision wasn't too bad so but we still injected because of the presence of cnv so another patient of course uh, myops which you all know the other day we were discussing that myops get about five to ten percent myops pathological myops or even moderate myops get cnv the test of choice is a home amsler grid and in case you need to get a hemorrhage you see in a patient who's myopic hemorrhage is there sometimes the fa does not pick up the new vessels because this is too thick but you can see this is the hemorrhage but here the arrow is showing the small cnv such a patient has to be injected with the antivirus okay so injured sticks another diagnostic black irritating irritating lines which have don't follow a straight pattern but they go a zigzag like an earthquake or something like that so it goes all the way unfortunately towards the fovea also and you can get cnvm formation there and so you have to inject this patient's prognosis guarded because over time some fibrosis does occur. So they have to live with some compromised vision. But you should always look when you see a CNVM, also look for the around the disc for any cracks or this kind of a metallic double row, uh, pigmentary double row seen all around and extending radially all around from the disc. So this is another differential diagnosis. Now coming to the anti of era, we are now in the anti of era. So so the anti of monotherapy is a standard line therapy, frankly speaking. And uh, PDT is to fall back upon whenever we find there's absolutely, uh, uh, the, patient, the patient does not respond to therapy, the failure of therapy. Uh, in such cases, or uh, there's a, uh, you know, patient does not respond, so then you have to consider the PDT. So predominantly classic and minimally classic, the anchor and marina ranibizumab trials showed clearly that the effect of and uh, Branvizumab was much more superior than baiting. Then again, combination studies are early. These are early studies, so I'm just telling you. Denali and Mont Blanc, they combined PDT with Ranibizumab for new vascular AMD. They found uh, combinations only as a second line residue to do. They said there was no clinical benefit of adding PDT to Ranibizumab. So Ranibizumab monotherapy stayed on top. No ro role of a combination. First line combination was only suggested in every study one and two but not in the planet or the laptop so the whatever study did say that you, should, you can do combined pc uh, whether you want to give ilia or whether you want to give ranibizumab depending on planet or 
laptop you can give it but you can uh, they said monotherapy but everest was the only one which said combination therapy as a first line now, the choice and costs are of course there i won't go into these details everybody is discussed it cat ivan manta gifan lucas study showed that bevacizumab is non inferior to ranibizumab bevacizumab is still widely used of never for neovascular md lower economic burden to the healthcare system from but apart from the safety concerns the safety concerns are massive you can get an endothelmitis a multi dose vial i think got to either we have laid down guidelines about 3 4 years back in 1916 and we laid down four of us laid down guidelines where how you can prepare whether the best is to of course prepare the single dose ampules which you do at rp center but otherwise we'll have to get two bottles two of those vials two of those syringes given to the for culture and the rest of the vials can be kept in a sterile tray, tray and then used either same day or they can be kept about 12 or 10 12 of them and they can be used later but it, i lead they say it can it last the efficacy is there for a one month but you can give it in about 15 days the efficacy of the vastin within the syringe so ranuvis map is uh, is not cost effective but it's very uh, of course it's going to cost you more but it does produce some better results especially in dme and even in emd we've seen so i'll come to the next thing what is a cat trial this cat trial is very important the vastin lucentis trial they wanted to show which is more effective for macular age related macular disease the study was a multi centered single blind non inferiority trial comparing vastin lucentis for patients with neovascular amd neovascular amd one was 1200 patients four groups lucentis monthly vastin monthly lucentis when neovascular is present when needed and vastin when that is a prn dosing this is standard dosing monthly and second is as and when when needed as and when both level of sentence following one year treated treated patient treated with lucentis and avastin monthly gained 8.5 and 8 letters slightly higher for the lucentis risk and the p uh, patient treated with lucentis and avastin on pr and dosing gained 6.8 and 5.9 letters again lucentis had more letters lucentis monotherapy monthly patients had significantly decreased retinal thickness compared to vastin or lucentis as needed so they said the fixed dose regimen did better than the as needed regimen especially for lucentis there's a mean decrease of 196 microns in the lucentis monthly group serious adverse events primarily hospitalizations occurred at a 24% for patients receiving vastin and a 19% for patients in need it was difficult to say what was the status of the patient at baseline but it, this shows that there was a little higher hospitalization in the vastin group Because it's a large molecule, you know, so it's the largest molecule of the antivirus of series. Aflibercept is the third which came in, and the main two trials which are important for a postgraduate to know is the VU one, VU two trial. This is a prospective randomized phase three trial, non-inferiority trial, evaluating the efficacy and safety of various doses and dosing of IFI or intravital aflibercept compared with ranibizumab. So they did a direct comparison of aflibercept and ranibizumab. Primary endpoint was the proportion of patients who maintain vision, defined as a loss of less than 15 ET DRS letters from baseline. Patients were follow followed up for 96 weeks. So patient BCBA gain was approximately the same. 15 letter gain was approximately the same. The visual gain, the loss was little le lesser in aflibercept as compared to ranibizumab. The fluid was definitely much less nearly 50% patients didn't have fluid as compared to 45.5% in ranibizumab so the fluid the dryness drying up of the fovea of the neovascular amd area as well as the letter acuity was less lost in aflibercept mildly and the number of injections were comparable so they said it may be beneficial in case of exudative amd treated with persistent fluid so the, this is a pulsar study the, the two three other studies which you can see but because of time time uh, bound program uh, this talk i'll tell you about this new aflibercept 8 mg formulation for intravital injection now we don't know what would be the side effects is a multi center randomized double mass study will ass assess the efficacy and safety of aflibercept 8 mg right now we giving 2 mg in treatment regimens of 12 weeks or greater of the three monthly 8 mg which is stated to start in 2020 probably post covid So, brolucizumab is something again. This is the fourth 
after the vastin bevacizumab and uh, ranibizu uh, the ranibizumab and uh, aflibercept we talked about cat we talked about v1 v2 we telling about brolizumab this may offer extended vegf inhibition this is the smallest tiniest vegf but this is only an antibody fragment uh, which has 26 kilo deltas of all the anti vegfs the smallest anti vegf is brolizumab smaller the molecule fragment small, higher may be the penetration and probably the effect may be more so hawk and harrier there are number of other studies but this there are three or four studies you can study about them but the phase 3 hawk and harrier efficacy outcomes are very important the primary endpoint in both studies hawk and harrier was on non inferiority of brolizumab to the to the most po- uh, effective aflibercept they wanted to take on and fight with the most toughest wrestlers so the two toughest wrestlers, wrestlers got together in the in the boxing ring and they decided that the mean bca from baseline to 48 lower limit of 95% confidence interval is required to be greater than 4 liters so they had to be uh, the brolizumab map at q12 12 weeks or at 8 week duration 6 mg 6 mg was given achieved non inferiority in mean change in bca compared with aflibercept at 8 weeks this is at 2 months this is 3 months and this is 3 months 2 months and this is 2 months with the aflibercept it's either however rolizumab was a more potent drying agent so they achieved non inferiority in, in as compared to vision rolizumab was non inferior to aflibercept in vision but when it came to drying again like aflibercept had more drying versus ranibizumab here they, it was the reverse novartis said no we got a, a drug better than you so novartis said told uh, bayer that listen we got a more potent drying agent so we got brolizumab more drying so drying is also probably important and the vision was comparable now this uh, initial study is going on but then asr has received reports of inflammation with brolizumab in administration in addition to mild to moderate intraocular inflammation these reports have included 14 cases of occlusive vasculitis now this is undergoing asrs and fdr uh, they're going to see through it and probably with the era over uh, with soon it will be i've talked a lot on these webinars on you know covid and we got a little i thought we'll shift to retina a little back to our home territory so now this is a beautiful pic- slide which will tell you that this is ranibizumab vegf fab fragment anti vegf a 48 kilo deltas okay second comes unlicensed off label bevacizumab not approved for nevascular md ranibizumab was approved this is a full molecule fab and fc fragment highest weight molecular weight mass 147 kilo deltas then comes a flibercept the third person in the in the boxing ring that's also from the us you see how the americans totally dominate except for this chinese product which you don't like to use so you see the aflibercept has also a weight of 97 to 115 kilo deltas but it has receptor binding it has two receptor vegf receptor 1 and receptor 2 and it's a fusion protein so they have receptors and it's a fusion protein it can bind very powerfully to vegf receptors and therefore it is a very potent uh, anti vegf agent it also binds not only is a vegf a it is binds to the central growth factor and vegf b so unlike other uh, anti vegf agents who don't in the, the first two don't the placental growth factor vegf b becomes a three things first thing it's a fusion protein it's got receptor binding capacity and second thing is pigf binding and vegf b fourth is ziv aflibercept this is a form in which you might like to get intravenous so this is not approved it's not even off label because you have a alternative in aflibercept if you use ziv aflibercept and you get the side effect of toxic reaction you had it nobody will save you from patiala high courts criminal courts because see for bevacizumab map we don't have an option we are we can use it off label and we've got off label use we have we have articles all over the us 
American article saying that off-label use is permitted, even the compounding pharmacies in the U.S. are giving. Zivay flipper you can do as many research you want to do, bring out papers, it's good for you, you get papers, you get name. Now also people are doing webinars for name only. So Zivay flipper is basically IV and it's, I would not recommend it and it's again like, just like a flipper so I'm going to pass by. Combercept also, I'm not so interested, it was approved in China, it's a fusion protein again. Not so potent, it's got 143 kilo delta. We don't have it in India and we don't have any results of this. And now I'm coming to the last most important. So we've got ranibizumab, very important. We've got bevacizumab, very important. We've got aflibercept, very important, three. And you should know brolucizumab, four. Four, this is FD approved from Novartis, Hawk and Harrier are the studies. It's, it's, it's a very single chain variable fragment, single chain variable fragment, very tiny. 26 kilo daltons. So as of now, it has a great potential. Only thing is you got to get over that some degree of inflammation and all that. So this you should know. Now setting up for dosing can be monthly PRN. There have been debates in ABS, VRSI debates here and there in month, state meetings also treat and extend. So is PRN better or treat or extend? One person pro con, pro PRN con treat and extend. But a lot of people are saying that treat and extend may give you shorter visits of the patients and give you a more scientific way of treating the CNVM or the new vascular wet AMD. Because Altair study done in Japan, the TAE was, a, you must know this study. Altair treat and extend study done in Japan only used two extension protocols. That means you extend it by two weeks and four weeks in treating new vascular AMD with aflibercept. Both were equally effective at two week interval. Matlab you delayed by 22 weeks, then or you do it four weeks extension and see. Both will at 52 weeks. That means uh, uh, to, nearly one year, little bit more than one year. At one year, they found that two and four week extension protocols for treat and extend were equally same, whether you use two week gaps or use four week gaps. And uh, they conducted variations. So, Altair is giving us a very good, uh, you know, the direction that we can use treat and extend in a very wise way. Okay, you must know this study. It's very relevant. Now, photodynamic therapy, as I told you, is also says as a treatment for new vascular AMD or for polypoidal choroidal vascular. I'll go a little faster. Uh, and PDT is basically you have the tap and the whip study, whether it's for classic or occult. And photodynamic therapy, uh, you already know what photodynamic, uh, it's a photodynamic dye and it concentrates in the new vascular mass and it, when you give 689 nanometer laser, there's a release of singlet oxygen and the new vascular membrane destroys, there is no collateral damage. Wherever you attack a play place, you don't want collateral damage. The commandos wanted to attack the terrorists in Kashmir, but they had, they wanted to avoid collateral damage, so they got killed. So see, in medicine, collateral damage is still required. You don't want normal retina macula to be affected. So this is avoiding collateral damage by giving reduced flow and speedity. Instead of 50 joules, you give 25 joules. You can give half dose also. But the reduced fluence is supposed to be equally effective. Okay, we have this paper in 2018, uh, so a large survey uh, review, review article. Defining the, I'm coming now from a, to a variant of AMD. And just go through some slides. It's central serous chorotopathy, pachycardic pigment epithelopathy, pachycardic neovasculopathy, and PCV. Okay, there are four groups, and this has been described that all four have some kind of a pachy, a thick, thick choroid. Now, is it a separate entity or is it a subtype of AMD? We don't know yet. So, we still got to find out whether we have a separate entity in these four diseases or they are just variants of neovascular AMD. There's nobody is clear yet. So, so first of these entities, central serous chorotopathy, we got a lot of uh, art material with us, but we just show a few slides I want to show you. The classical smokestack pattern and through the PED, which is breaking through the, uh, the proteinaceous material is going through. So this was showing a axial OCT with the uh, proteinaceous fibrin material passing through and picked up just when the uh, flu this leak was taking place. So usually they have uh, sleep disturbances we've seen in our place at RP center, subretal fibrin like this, 
and you can have multiple fibrin like this material look as if there's some huge uh, subretinal mass over like but it's actually fibrin and the patient is uh, having recurrent CNV of sleep disturbances. Uh, multimodal imaging is very important. So you do AF imaging, you can do FA, you can do ICG, you can do Octa, and you can do a Excel OCT. So, patient with night shift, sleep disturbances, CSC, early BCV, you've got some mortal fluorescence, mortal autofluorescence here, some leaks here on FA. So, there's a single hemorrhage, some hemorrhage here on the ICG with some large, maybe a polyp there. And on the octa also, we saw, saw some new vessel membrane formation there. So there's probably a early PCV coming up with a, you know, there are two types of PCV. One is a polypoidal, polypoidal CNV, which is only polyps. And one is a typical PCV, which is having BVN and polyps. The polypoidal CNV is only polyps. So this, this is, doesn't have BVN. So it's a polypoidal. It's a polypoidal CNV. The only polyp is there. And you can see there's a small elevation PED and some subretinal fluid. So this patient required treatment not only for CSR, but also for the polyp and the new vessels coming in. So the polyp can burst. So we early, pick, because of the good quality of imaging we have here, we could pick up the early PCV and treat with antivagin. This is also, treatment is quite the same as what we do for AMD. So it's a part of AMD. PCV cannot be considered separate. It's part of AMD, totally. Because you still don't know what it is. Now, you patient hyperpermeability because of C, uh, FA, because of, in the choroid, in the choroid, because of hyperpermeability. This is a choroidal hyperpermeability. We don't know what CSC is caused. We don't know what PC is caused. But we've seen choroidal hyperpermeability in both. The severe dye starts leaking out. And there's some uh, nodular lesions can be seen. And this is because of the increased pressure in the choroidal vessels. The increased pressure in the choroidal capillaries causes some or nodular changes and then the, the presence of choroidal hyperpermeability. Now, whether it's related to some receptors or whatever, we'll have to see. See the severe choroidal hyperpermeability. And uh, this is probably an early CNVM coming up here in the right eye. The right eye showing up early CNVM. You see this, you see this, the exit scan shows a double air sign. This is thought to be the RP lifted up and this is thought to be the Brooks. The two layers. Beautifully described by the Americans, you know, and this Yanolji's uh, uh, group is doing a great job in New York. Rick Spade also and all of them. So you can see a PED with a double layer sign. So this is a kind of an early PCV coming up and you have to treat this patient with not treatment for CCSC. That means even if you plan a PED, you'll have to give an antivirus. That's what I'm trying to say. So this is another loco pilot. I'm getting, I'm writing all those patients which you've seen recently before the COVID came, night shifts again. So night shifts are becoming a big headache. There's increased adrenaline release when you don't sleep in a well in a night, then you probably get up with CSE. Six months later, he had a CSE in the paramacular region. We did PDT. So this is post PDT, he's fine. Okay, CSE, CSE, post PDT, reduced fluency, 6-6. Probably some vision had dropped because of fluid trickled down. Fellow eye, he developed some granuloma after six months. So he thought of tubercular granuloma. We gave him anti, we gave him ATT, and then we're going to see him again. Now we've given ATT to this patient. Okay. Sleep deprivation can produce pictures akin to fluid tracts or RP disturbances. This RP disturbances are classical of chronic CSC. So when you see these fluid tracts, these are like a pigment epithelopathy. This is something like you see uh, of the variant of CSR. This is, a, this is classical of fluid tracking in the subretinal space going up and down. But it's just fluid and so it, it it spoils the whole surface of the RP. So the RP regularity. So CSC is, can be there, it can be recurrent. And the OCT shows very uh, severe choroidal thickness, more so of the Haller's layer. And the satellites in the choroidal cavity start getting compressed. So Pigment epithelopathy is a form of frustrate. You only get this pigmentation, a lot of pigmentation here and there, but you may get some fluid, but no CNVM. You get a thickened choroid. You get thickened choroid, 389, 339, it's normally 275. You'll get thickened choroid, okay, so it's a packy. It's got form of frustrate of CSC. Pigment alterations may be there. 
and these vessels are compressed. The halus compresses the satellites and the core capillaries, more the halus, uh, satellites. So these mechanically, mechanically get in, compressed and the whole RP becomes atrophic and pigmentary disturbances start. This is because of the halus getting thicker. And this thickness usually doesn't go back. Some people say after, after giving antiogens may go back a little bit, but not much. So this is the third form which is neovasculopathy. This is thought to be due to this double layer sign, but no polyps are there. And you can get these poly, polyps present, uh, these new vessels present in the under the RP. Under the RP, anterior or superficial to the brooks. So this is type 1 neovascularization. When it becomes anterior to the RP, it becomes type 2 in the subretinal space. When it goes into a retinal, it is type 3. The classical example of a type 3 retina, retinal anastomosis and neovascularization is retinal angiomatous proliferance or popularly known as RAP. That also goes down in the stages to become finally pigment epithelial detachment. The new vessels go through it, and then you get a retinal choroidal elastomosis (RCA). So but this is type one polypoidal choroidal vascularity always presents with type one new vessels, and then moves upwards, or it can affect with polyps and all that. So polypoidal choroidal vascularity is the last of the four, and soon I'll be concluding also because I know time is going. To, we have 15 minutes. Polypoidal is a vasculopathy located in the RP inner choroid. Okay, an image best with ICG. This is Yanozi telling us. So I, ICG tells us best about choroid. You want to image choroid, do ICG. Simple as that. Predilection for Asian ancestry, so we see a lot. You have seen the number of cases we have seen. We have got two publications also. It is a standalone clinical identity or it is a variant or new vascular identity. Uh, new vascular identity, we still do not know. It could be because the treatment is the same. The same ranibizumab is the same aflibercept and the same bubu or which will come, we will use that only. So the features are consistent with the pachychoroid phenotype, thick choroids, absence of drusen, but there can be drusen. 20 to 40 percent patients of PC may have some drusen. The irregular PDs, this masquerades as CSC, but CSC is part of the spectrum. So this is some polyps, polypoidal CNV with hardly any uh, PV and batch, uh, branching vascular network. It's like a thumb-like PD, and this PD is the same one with fluid on each side, probably a double layer side, and so we'll have to inject and improve this patient. And Octa tells you beautifully that there is presence of new vessels. The BVN is there. So the Octa actually is taking over from ICG in some ways. Because it's not easy to do a monthly ICG. It's painful to the patient. Uh, and uh, Octa is a quick test. If it's properly focused, you can do a make you can do you don't have to do an automated. So you don't need to do an automated, so you can do a you know manual OCTA. You shift to manual. As soon as automated has been done, shift to manual and pick up these new vessels very clearly. That's what we like to do. So this is another patient who's got BVN classical and with polyps at the edge of the BVN. There's all the BVN over here also. And he's got a thumb-like PD, very classical thumb-like PD with serious fluid, some double layering. So this is classical. So this is another patient who's got a small polyp peripapillary, which is very classical. There's a PD and some double layer, double layer sign. And so this is a patient who had a chronic CSC and we got uh, a hemorrhagic PED on the side. So we just thought we'll get an ICG done. The ICG picked up polyps lying within the PD, hemorrhagic PED. So he had bent into the hemorrhagic PED. And so we treated this with photodynamic therapy and anti because this is a nice case for a photodynamic therapy. It's away from the center. So whatever vision loss was there in the center is fine. But we treated this, uh, so it doesn't the hemorrhage doesn't extend into the center or something. So we treated this very effectively. So see evolution from CSC to BCV is patient with severe CSC, chronic serous retinopathy and develops subretinal fibrin due to the uh, chronic PC CSC. And then he finally developed double air sign and a small PD with double air sign. So 
you have to see this is a polyp over here with a lot of branching vascular networks. So this is a, this is a typical PCV. Typical PCV will have BVN with it. So you can see the large polyp. Which is the polyp is usually present within the thumb like PV. So this is a small video on the Heidelberg. Sometimes there may be a software. I saw one Jay's video where he was showing the pulsatile polyp. But anyway. It's a typical polyp with a brilliant center and a hypofluorescent halo around it. This is a serious PD, often mistaken for CSE. But uh, this this C, uh, small uh, serious PD actually is disconnected and it's, or could be just connected and we, we, we picked up a lot of uh, polyps here, peripapillary polyps. So we treated the entire lesion with uh, first we gave anti and then we, I think we gave to PD, PDT with this, this patient. Now we've got the ICG, the Optus California and you can do, uh, you can magnify zoom up and see the polyps so clearly. So the ICG is useful even for PA, PEHCR patients. So but for macular polyps also you can see this and then use the software present within the machine to zoom up. You can uh, sharpen the image and you can, you know, play around with the image to make it the best possible and take it out for your for your documentation purposes, also for teaching purposes. So this is peripheral exudative hemorrhagic choroidal retinopathy. This is thought to be a variant of PCV. It is thought to be present in the periphery. The differential diagnosis is melanoma. So please don't see a case of melanoma and rush to melanoma. Differential diagnosis of melanoma is PEHCR seen in the older people, the same age group as the melanoma. You'll see a lot of hemorrhages, exudates. When you see hemorrhages and exudates, try and get a wide field, like a Optos California, FFA, ICG, combine the two. Then you'll pick up these uh, mottled areas of fluorescence. You might pick up polyp, but you may see this mottled fluorescence. And if you think and the ultrasound also doesn't is not consistent with this hemorrhage consistent with that of a melanoma then you can very well give an anti -vager. definitely treat this with an anti -vager. and uh, we've run this a laser i've done at least seven eight cases of these phc they have done wonderfully well they're just they are stable and following up so you just need to follow up maybe four to six months six monthly once they're stable not earlier Submacular hemorrhage is the last thing I'm talking about, polyps there, hemorrhage. So this, we must have done about 100 cases. We've reported this also in the Asia Pacific Journal of Ophthalmology. And uh, this is a case which had a severe submacular hemorrhage due to polypoidal polyp of a PCVI bursting. And so we sometimes get these patients, despite receiving their injections, monthly injections of ranibizumab or ILEA, they bleed. So we get foxed, you know, why did it happen? Because we just gave the injection one month back. So here you can see the, we are inducing the PVD. The first thing you got to induction the PVD. We, we, I like to operate on the uh, Ingenuity machine, you know, 3D. So I don't look through the microscope and I like to use goggles and this goggles will help me during the COVID era and the post COVID era. So I see the huge hemorrhage over here. So I put a 41 gauge translocation needle because this is self sealing. Till today and these maybe 100 cases I've done, never have I had a RD because of a retinotomy. It's because this 41 gauge uh, uh, self sealing retinotomies are really actually self sealing. So, what you do to create a inject cocktail of Avastin, TPA, and air. And all of my residents know that this works well because we make the patient sit up. And this is the picture next day, two weeks, sorry. So, evidence based guidelines for PCV, average study recommended PDT or in combination with ranibizumab. Three injections, one month apart, or ranibizumab alone. Polyg regression, they said, was best with PDT in ranibizumab. Followed by PDT alone and ranibizumab alone, with polyp closure rates of 77 in combination, 71 in PDT alone, and 28% with ranibizumab alone. The details you can read from Everest 1 and 2. The PLANET study said the A-flavor set for more therapy was effective. The treatment naive PCV to achieve the resolution of poly polyps. Reported 2016 Retina Journal. 
you should go through these studies these studies are important i have told you which are studies are important i emphasized it like altair study is very important so you better see that and hawk harrier you got to see and you have to see those other studies also anchor marina you got to see so laptop study was actually comparing ranibizumab and bartiporfen ranibizumab demonstrated improvement in both crt and logmar visual acuity mean change was the logmar visual acuity was p point, uh, 0.001 and they found that uh, they found that ha ah, sorry this is ranibizumab and bartiporfen they found the individual injection of ranibizumab was more effective in pdd so the laptop study the they found that ranibizumab was more effective in pdd itself for pcv so we are treating many of our patients with pdd who who are having pcv either with aflibercept or with ranibizumab only when they become recalcitrant non responsive to therapy or a failed therapy the, these words are very you know they got to understand these words recalcitrant from failed therapy and all that not responding so sometimes you switch the injection but that's you know i think when it's not responding pdd can be added on there's a definite role of pdd i've seen that myself i put on the patient on pdd after 6 7 injections or maybe 5 injections if they don't respond at all the fluid is not going down and the uh, the risk of hemorrhage is there and the patient vision is not improving then the i recommend in the real world experience that you must add on this reduced fluid speed and we still by with god's grace we have the dye and the machine and of course the last slide is the low vision aids is finally the thing you have to do in many places so we have a very well equipped low vision aid center where they teach you eccentric viewing which i tell my patients also to see eccentric viewing in uk is very popular so they like to look through the edge of the lesion and they get to used to looking from the ex, uh, just outside the and so this was my book and this is thank you so any questions are welcome if i can answer them it's fine if i don't i'll tell you i don't know this is right right now it's 4 40 Yes, thank you. Yes. Okay, so the PPE is a it's one of the variants of uh, PCV and uh, CSC, and it's it's a form first day of of uh, CSC. Are you hearing me now? Yes. Coming. One second. We have two or three residents here just checking. Okay, so it's a form first day, and it wasn't there before the audio, so. it looks just like csc it's chronic csc because the pigment alterations are there and the pigment alterations make it look like that but there's no pachycoroid probably the pachycoroid would be a clinching thing in case of a ppe because the pachycoroid would be there and you may not have active leaks in ppe but if you have a pachycoroid there present and uh, then it would definitely mean it's a ppe csc usually you don't develop in the maybe in the later stages you develop some degree of pachycoroid but 
it would be difficult to diagnose, I agree. But no active leaks would be there. PP wouldn't show any leaks. Cla classic leaks, just you see any CSR lesion. Audio is it's audible, okay. No, no, not yet muted. No, it's audible law. Lohit, you say you're different retinal pathologies. There's only conjunctive itis. And that also the tears, there's a recent article, not in, not in press, it's in press, by ophthalmology said that tears hardly contain the coronavirus. It's only seen in the nasal and the mucus secretions. So the tears don't contain it. They said if the eyes get red during the during the disease, it could be because of the back pressure of the pulmonary disease. You might get some redness and congestion. But otherwise, they said normally tears don't contain and blood doesn't contain coronavirus. That's what the thinking is right now. But as time goes on, we'll know about the tears. How what do I mean? Will they actually contain or not? But right now, the reports publish data which is going to be, which is in press from ophthalmology, that is American Academy of Ophthalmology, AO, standard text, standard journal says that there's going, there's going to be no, they have found no coronavirus, this novel coronavirus, SARS-CoV-2 in tears. Only thing they get it is in the mucous membranes. It's muted again. It's audible. Yeah. If you have any questions, I'm welcome. While uh, using Sundar, good question. Very uh, any specific precaution to take. The only precaution you got to take uh, take is during giving the anti is to wear a N95 mask, Deepak, yourself, and ask the patient to wear a mask also. Not an N95, but at least a surgical mask, or he should bring a mask. If they come to the OPD also, a restricted OPD, they have to bring their mask. If they don't bring the mask, the hospital should supply a three-ply mask to them. And once we, we should not postpone. Because frankly speaking, it makes no sense. That way we'll postpone everything. And these anti are usually an emergency procedure. They are having new vascular AMD. They may bleed. Even DME and patients may have a severe de deterioration of vision. So I personally feel that these injections should be given whether COVID or no COVID pandemic, and you just have to take the proper precautions. We give a couple of drops of betadine, uh, povidone iodine before they enter the OT, and while, before that, antibody drops. Nobody talks. Uh, we all wear masks. We wear N95. We don't talk. When the patient is draped as we do previously, we've got HEPA filters, unidirectional AC flow, no internal circulation of air, and we make sure the patient has a mask if you put the proper drape, the style specular, and we inject. So only thing is an extra mask and no talking, that's all. Anything else? Any blink or ink blot leak of CAC and polyp? Polyp on FA. Polyp is usually not seen on FA. It may be seen, but usually seen on ICG. And uh, polyp may not be seen so well on FA. CAC leak is a FA diagnosis. Shreya, polyp you'll see, ideally ICG needs to be done. As a slow flow lesion, it may not be picked up on Octa also, OCTA also. Only the BVN will be picked up on Octa. Hitesh, good evening, sir. How do you treat a patient of CSC where the leak is near fovea? Apart from the elimination risk factors, three months wait could do reduce flow and speedity. And you can also give uh, the Epiron as a treatment. Epiron is a, you know, antagonist of uh, spironolactone and it's a specific, it's a, Specific, it doesn't have any side effects, no androgenic problems, and no potassium loss. So, potassium supplements can be given, but usually we shouldn't uh, tolerate Epiron 50 milligram a day for about a month to six weeks can be given. And he should also be counseled for his living. And normally, I find out they like loco drivers, now they, they're working the night. Sugar. We write it on their card that they don't need to work at night, they'll have to shift to day duties. If he's not possible, then he'll have to quit that job and take another job. So lifestyle change. So we can do PDT. Laser is out and any anti vegf has no role. So PDT and uh, Epiron. If this again, if OCT shows no fluid, you can still new versus an octa. Do we inject or wait? Good question. Wait. OCT is the deciding factor. 
octa fluids are there octa universes are there we'll keep it in mind we'll call them back in a month and then see navneet sir how to differentiate mavic syndrome from patient in vascular md with mavia they are very tough but mavic syndrome is really tiny and vascular md may be larger thicker mavic syndrome is very tiny and you know in vascular md also can be there but basically the treatment is the same anti vegers whether you error on the side of nevascular md also you will still give an anti vegers like you say ranibizumab or you give aflibercept or bevacizumab so what is the current status of fovista fovista that is gone down the drain it was supposed to be a chemical stripper of uh, vegf is there was initial work by praveen dugal i wish it's there but unfortunately the study could not take off because of some side effects and problems no study right now what is the take on oral epinephrine definitely it's there even in pcv i think we are doing a thesis we are doing a study of epinephrine because this the entire spectrum there is a patient uh, complaining of lack of sleep or uh, you know they having obstructive sleep apnea osa or they have problems in uh, you know anxiety related and all that so epinephrine may be effective in pcv also i think recent study from somewhere else may have said it but we are doing our own we'll see if they study from the us saying that it has no role doesn't mean we can't do our own study we can do our own study from anywhere part of the world nikita gupta sir in nitika i'm scared of your answer the questions because you are sir in the context of the double layer on ocd always hyper reflective in pcv is a recent article which says that contained in double layer differentiates okay because a double layer is usually see, double layer may not be there in ppe it may be there, there in pnv nikita pnv mein to double layer is always there hoti hai that is how pnv mein you you call it a polypoidal neovasculopathy there you have, don't have a polyp you don't have a thumb like pd but you have a double layer but that is p b c pnv that is not ppe and pnv is not a form for a stay of csr csc sorry i hope that answers the question thank you thank you thank you wonderful lecture excellent lecture thank you very much to all of you who came to listen i'm always there to answer your questions and i know i may have some shortcomings in something which i have not covered you can always ask me offline uh, for the residents who are there they can ask me if anybody else was listening then you can always email me at atul uh, ATL fifty six Kumar at yahoo dot com. You can call, uh, mail me and ask me if you think I can answer you. But there are hundreds and very uh, you know very well read and very renowned celebrities of retina are there, so they can also answer questions. But this is my this thing. What sir? What is your take on stem cells in advanced non university? We've done some work in RP Center about stem cells, and uh, uh, unfortunately, we did get some improvement. in the size of the new vascular the af showing the decrease in size of a lesion but otherwise there was not much vision improvement so we right now not too happy about the autologous stem cells maybe the uh, embryonic stem cells have but there are a lot of ethical issues in this ethical issues don't get you get you you don't get clearance you have to get it cleared by the aims ethics department and you got to cleared by the icmr ethics department and embryonic they may not agree as of now they said we won't agree so stem cells are way but probably it's a gene therapy or some you know something like uh, bramonidine implants which have a neuroprotective action on the cells may have some role role of hyperacuity acting yeah yeah home hyperacuity testing i was going to say can be also useful uh, besides home screen absolutely absolutely i agree with you Thank you, Shairi. Thank you, Rashmi. Thank you, Anusha. Thank you, Shanaz, Prati, Pratiksh, Nisha, Jyoti, Ritu, Shivani, Joshi. I hope other people also listened in. Thank you, sis. Everybody. Any other questions? Thank you so much. We encourage people from everywhere to uh, uh, join in as we put it today in the groups also. We WhatsApp group. This is a, a PG educational class, and we try to bring in all our own material. all our own pictures and all our own uh, stuff what we have at rp center and share it with all of you and this way 
we can you know interchange exchange all our views what you have and you can ask questions you can mail us later and you can see this uh, on facebook you can go through the whole lecture again if you have any questions you can mail me or whatsapp me also i'll be most uh, happy to answer any of your questions argus implant is there it has problems in the sense that definitely for no plis but you got to have inner retina working for no pli retina is pigmentous eyes not for amd amd eye has very good peripheral vision so uh, this question has been asked by surbhi agarwal so surbhi argus ka to role sirf rp ke disease where there is no pl and the patient wants ambulatory vision he can see a shadow he'll be happy he'll see a shadow of your you you standing there he'll be so happy so, and then there is a risk of rejection but of course it's, the surgery is good mark hawaiyo gave it gave it to the world and it's fda approved and it has a role for no pli but it has to be inner retina function there's some other parameters also which have to be there i mean your prerequisites which has to meet that uh, for argus implant but definitely you can mail uh, mark hamayu the innovator of this argus 2 or you can read his article and see what he said about the latest it cost about 50 lakhs to a uh, 50 lakhs plus for one argus implant and uh, so the cost factor would also be quite a bit thank you so much i'll have to say goodbye to you because the staff here the set facility aims has to leave thank you